Preparing for this sermon today, I've been struck by the brilliance of Luke in setting forth the gospel. It makes me an evangelical, <laughs> but don't get too worried. Because let me give you a little bit of an outline, then I want to go into some more depth. Um, the Holy Spirit comes down uh, in the story of Jesus' baptism. The Holy Spirit comes down in bodily form. It's interesting that Luke is the only one of uh, the three synoptic gospels of Matthew, Mark, Luke, the only one who says that the Holy Spirit comes in bodily form like a dove. The others just go right down and say like a dove. So you know that when you see something like that, that the gospel writer is up to something. So you scratch your head, bodily form. And then you continue and you realize that in Luke, Jesus comes, the Holy Spirit comes in bodily form for Jesus. And then Jesus is the Holy Spirit coming in bodily form for the disciples and the world of his time in his ministry. And then the church becomes the Holy Spirit coming down in bodily form for the world. Luke has set up a kind of brilliant process that he sees in the work of God's action. So let's go into it a little bit more, more deeply because it's not just that the Holy Spirit comes in bodily form. With the Holy Spirit come the words, you are my beloved child, my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. I'm so pleased with you. You can also translate this as, you are my child, I love you so much, you're my favorite. Now that's great because we all want to be the favorite, don't we? We all want to be the favorite. We all want to be loved and we all want to please each other. I still, oh my gosh, I am the world's best attempter at people pleasing. Because we all want to be, we want to be loved. We want to please others. We want to feel that, that we're valued and appreciated. Well, it is this message of God, of the Spirit, that Jesus delivered through the Spirit in concrete bodily form in his flesh and blood with the gentleness of a dove. It is this message, you are my beloved, my favored, my favorite one, that sends him forth to his ministry. And nothing, not even Satan in the wilderness, who took that declarative sentence, you are, and turned it into a conditional, if you are, nothing, not even Satan, can rob him of this incredible identity set firmly within his heart and being. Luke, in his own critical, brilliant and radical way, then follows by showing how the Holy Spirit descends again and again to people in flesh and blood ways in the person and ministry of Jesus, in his words and actions and attitudes, in his healing, in his willingness to, to touch the untouchable leper, in his, the story of the lost son, the prodigal son who has squandered his inheritance and yet is received back home by an endlessly forgiving, searching, and loving father who then throws him a celebration. Jesus is not out to be a faith healer. Jesus is not out to be a revolutionary radical. They were a dime a dozen in those days and their names, for the most part, are lost to history. Jesus was the one in whom the Holy Spirit was descending on people's lives, transforming their core identity 
from that of outcast and sinner, sick or crippled, shamed or traumatized, to that of beloved, a favored and pleasing one. But this transformation does not come from the clouds. It comes through the spirit in bodily form, the body of Jesus. I've come to believe that Luke believes that even before Jesus' baptism, it was a setup. Think about what Elizabeth says to Mary when she's pregnant with Jesus. Hail, O highly favored one. The same words. Jesus had to have the experience of this love in the flesh, in the flesh and blood of his parents, and that's why we honor them. And so at that moment of his baptism, it crystallized in bodily form. And then he went out. And Luke does not just stop with Jesus, for if the gospel which bears his name is about the spirit coming into people's lives through the flesh and blood and body of Jesus, Luke's second book, the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, is about the Holy Spirit descending in bodily form through the body of Christ, the church. That community, us, of the spirit-filled people sent out in all directions with the good news, hey, guess what? You are loved. You are God's favorite. You are God's favorite. And that's something we all need to hear. And that favor, that beloved, that well-pleasedness needs to be conveyed and taken in. It has to come in bodily form. It has to be a message conveyed in flesh and blood through actions and attitudes and care and concern, words verbalized in and through flesh and blood works of love and care and mercy, compassion. Those are what convey the Spirit's message. You are loved, beloved, God's favorite child. You see, we're flesh and blood people. We struggle with ourselves. I struggle with myself. There are many a time where I certainly show my less, less lovable, lovely self. My wife, during those moments, asked me, uh, and you do what for a living? <laughs> Our spouses, our partners, our closest <laughs> friends, they know, but they also embody for us, embody the fact that we are God's favorites, and so are they. But we must be immersed in this message, baptized in it to such an extent over that all the false messages we receive that shame us or brutalize or traumatize us or devalue us, even the DNA messages that become the filters for external messages and all the other messages that come to us in bodily form, such as you're a sinner, you're not worth my time, or you're invisible to me because of who you are or what you don't have, all these messages that take residence in us and control us and drive our attitudes and create bitterness and hatred, consciously and unconsciously, and form out our actions these need to be literally drowned as we are baptized into the waters of God's true love. And it's not just the message about us, it's the truth about our neighbor, the Samaritans and the lepers in our lives, those outside of our social or political or gender or sexual or cultural tribe, those who scare us or make us uncomfortable or re revolt us or hate us, they need to be baptized in the waters of divine love we bring to them. There are no guarantees that their hearts are going to be changed, but that doesn't matter 
It doesn't matter. A few weeks ago, I had the privilege of watching this church community welcome the homeless as we do every year, as we feed and house and tend them, men and women who, like Jesus, had nowhere to lay their head. I kept saying to myself, these are God's favorites, just like us. I saw young people and old people from this parish lovingly keeping watch through the night so our guests could rest safe and warm. The guests were not always lovely people. I got to know one guest, I'll call him William. Seemed like a nice kid in his 30s, you know, that's a kid to me now. And I sat down with him as he was eating and I said, tell me about yourself and we talked and he told me about his girlfriend and she was in a wheelchair. And I said, oh, William, how did she become a, get in a wheelchair? He said, I beat her up. But I feel sorry now. He's still God's favorite and so is she. It's challenging, it's challenging but somehow that rage in him needs to be showered with God's love. In and through welcome and work, the Holy Spirit descends in bodily flesh and blood form. I witness this through your attitude and actions of kindness and hospitality and respect. Overwhelming people who walk into this church with the waters of God's love, with the sense that they too are God's favorites. And maybe in so doing, we are helping one another to know our own truth as beloved and pleasing. And then maybe as we do this for others, they do it for still others that the spirit of love might descend in bodily form through them along others along the way. Doesn't the broken world need this message that Luke sets forth in his books, needs to be touched and baptized, overwhelmed by the Holy Spirit descending on their lives, healing their brokenness, turning hearts of stone into hearts of warm flesh? And I have to say, as I say frequently, it's sad that so often the church gets the message of Luke so wrong. The church gets caught up in judging and blaming, in purity, purity and passion. The only purity in the church is the purity of love. It's a simple message in the end that the Spirit conveys at Jesus' baptism through his ministry and through us. You are loved. You are my favorite one. This is good news. And that's what makes me an evangelical. Because I want this good news to get out of there. And as we baptize Rachel this morning, that's the good news that is showered upon her. That's the light that is proclaimed in her life. Amen.